Hi Year 5, um, English time. So uh, today we're continuing to look at Cosmic and we're going to skip a little bit ahead in the book um, and we're going to do a little bit of writing based on something that happens slightly further on in the book. Um, so that's going to be later on in the lesson. Now firstly attached to the tapestry post is a starter activity based on prepositions um, which I think we've covered before but as always we could do with a little bit of a recap on. So prepositions tell us the clues in the name tell us the position of of a noun within the sentence so it will go generally they'll be linked with nouns and they'll tell us where about something is so there's a powerpoint with some interactive activities to have a go on just to get your english brains warmed up so if you flick over to that now then hop back onto this video and we'll talk about the writing that you are going to be doing today Okay, year five. So um, we're going to continue with cosmic today. Now, as I said um, earlier on in the video, we're going to skip ahead slightly. So we read the first couple of chapters of cosmic. I'm going to fill you in on some of the plot that um, takes place. And then, um, then we're going to do some writing based on a bit further on in the book. So Liam, the main character, um, has been mistaken for an adult um, and that's how he's got onto this mission now um, into space now the mission um, is to do with a secret astronaut training program now there are currently four other people on the training program there are um, Florida who's one of Liam's friends there's someone called Anna who is from Germany there's Sanson too who's from Sierra Leone Someone could do, somebody called Max from France and somebody called Hassan from Bosnia. So they are all on board as well as Liam. Now, I'm going to read you later on in the story and you'll see that Liam has a bit of a dilemma that he is facing. Okay, And we're going to explore that dilemma and what he should do in our writing today. So this is a chapter entitled You Don't Get Extra Lives in Space. I could barely even finish my cosmic quencher. I went over to the possibility building to look at the rockets. I thought it would make me feel better to see it, looking so solid with its extra oxygen tanks and its extra bulletproofing. Mr Bean was there, looking up at it too. I said, Mr Bean, has ever, anyone ever died on this? On this particular rocket? No. This is what you call an expendable launch vehicle. You're only supposed to use it once, a bit like one of those throwaway razors. You can't really know that an, expend an, that an expendable will work until it's already up there, and by then it's too late. The thought that they, were going to s that they were going to space in a throwaway razor wasn't particularly reassuring. It got worse. People do get killed on rockets, he went on. Gus Grissom, he died when Apollo 1 caught fire on the launch pad, along with Ed White and Roger Chaffee. Oh, right. But that was a long time ago. This is a different kind of rocket. If you're looking for something more recent... Well, I'm not looking exactly, I was just asking. The crew of the Columbia shuttle, they all died on re-entry. There were seven of them. The crew of the shuttle Challenger all died on takeoff. Seven of them too, all really young. I did say then, thanks, I think you've answered my question. But there was no stopping him. And then there was Soyuz 1 when the parachute didn't open. Vladimir Komarov, that was awful. He knew he had no chance. Everyone could hear him talking to his wife on the radio, talking about the kids and, oh, honestly... I said, that's enough information. Thank you. I began to walk away. Mr. Bean called after me. Going into space isn't like one of those video games. If you die, you don't get any extra lives. That's when I decided I was going to go and drag Florida out of the crew quarters and take her home to safety. We could walk home to Bootle if we had to. Obviously, it would, be, it would be better to go in a plane. So as I strode across the tramway lines and the bridge over the fire pit, I was rehearsing this speech I was going to make to Dr Drax about how it would be better for everyone if she gave us the airfare. But as I got nearer, I could hear shouting and saw a Draxcon personnel vehicle screeching up to the crew quarters. Dr Drax was yelling, and Mr Xanadu was yelling back at her and throwing his bags into the back of the car. As the car drove away, Dr Drax turned to go back into the house. Then she saw me, and she looked really surprised. Mr Digby, she said. How did you know? I suppose you guessed. I should have guessed myself, of course. I didn't know what she was on about. Mr Danad Zanadu, she said, has totally betrayed me. 
It turned out that when Mr. Xanadu was cheerily taking all those photographs of the penultima, he wasn't really interested in happy, smiling faces. He was taking photos of the flight simulator and the control panels. He sent the photographs to a toy company in Shanghai, asking them to build a full-size working replica of it for Hassan. Sadly for him, Dr. Drax also owned the Shanghai Toy Company. They told me everything. He even went to them with an idea to make dolls out of you all to sell. He was going to call them Astro Kids. Can you imagine? Where do these people get their ideas? At least no harm has been done. Except to Mr. Xanadu, of course. He will no longer be the responsible adult accompanying the children into space. That honour will go to the person who came second in the competition. Namely you, Mr. Digby. Oh, Give yourself a moment for the news to sink in. Somehow, it seemed to take more than a moment. Somehow, my brain wouldn't work. She said, Mr Digby? You mean I could go to space? And that is where we're going to leave it there. So, that is the dilemma that Liam, who at that stage in the book is going by the name of Mr Digby, that is the dilemma that he has. Do the, does he go to space or not? And that is what we're going to explore in our writing today. So we are going to look at our persuasive writing techniques, which we have looked at before. Um, and we are going to help Liam make the decision about whether or not he should go into space. Now, you can either take a for or against point of view. OK, so we're looking for two paragraphs, not balanced at all. You're trying to persuade Liam one way or the other about whether or not he should go into space. So. Attached to the tapestry post is a model before and against argument about um, what Liam should or shouldn't do. So we're going to look at that now as an example, and then it's over to you guys. You are going to write your own before and it, uh, your own um, persuasive argument about whether or not you think um, Liam should go into space. Remember, sorry, it's a persuasive argument. We're not balancing two points of view here. You're just trying to persuade him one way. So I'm going to show you that one now. Okay, so this is the example persuasive writing that I have attached to the tapestry post. Um, so you can kind of get the idea of what you're doing. Now, I've done one paragraph here, but from you guys, I'd like at least two paragraphs. So two paragraphs is fine. If you want to do any more than that, then you are welcome to. But I'd like to see at least two paragraphs. Now, as I said before, you can either be trying to persuade Liam to go into space or you can be trying to persuade him to not go into space. Okay, so I've taken the point of view of persuading him not to go into space. Um, however, you can try and persuade him to go into space if you like. So I've written, come on, Liam, it's time to give it up. We can't go into space, semicolon. We're not brave enough. Think about all of the famous astronauts who have died on landing. The crew of the Columbia shuttle, Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chaffee, the Challenger shuttle, Vladimir Komarov. The list goes on. Surely you can see that this would be a terrible idea. So, in terms of persuasive techniques that we've used then, we have used, um, we, we're talking, we're using the second person, we're talking directly to somebody reading us. So we're saying things like, come on, Liam. We're sort of conversational, um, but we're being quite forceful. We're speaking directly to Liam. OK, we've used a rhetorical question at the end. Surely you can see that this would be a terrible idea. And use of the word surely as well is quite powerful when we are using our um, persuasive language. Um, we use we've used quite emotive language. We're looking to try and play on the reader or Liam's emotions. We're talking about not being brave enough. We've then referred back to the text and the chapter in the text where uh, Mr. Bean has told us all about all of the different people who have died going into space. Okay, so I've we've used the text in that way there. In terms of high-level writing, we've also used a semicolon, and we've used a colon in there as well. So that's just an example that you can go off, and obviously you can magpie ideas from that if you wish. Um, that is attached to the tapestry post. And so just to recap then, year five, your task today is to write a persuasive piece of writing um, where we are trying to persuade Liam from Cosmic either to go into space or not to go into space. It's completely up to you. Any questions, as always, pop them on Tapestry for us. And um, I look forward to reading your persuasive writing later.